afternoon and welcome to the November 4th, 2016 meeting of the DNA subcommittee. I'm Dr. Adams. Also present are Drs. Batzer, Buell, Eastman, Kidd, and Sozer. And that constitutes a quorum. Uh, you've all received a draft agenda for today's meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? I have a motion. Second. Uh, all in favor, uh, raise the right hand, please. Thank you. Aye, aye. aye. <laughs> Unanimous. You've also received a draft copy of the minutes from the August 19, 2016 meeting. Uh, any questions or comments about those minutes? Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve those minutes? Dr. Eastman? Second. Dr. Sozer? Uh, all in favor, raise the right hand, please. I wasn't here, so yeah. all yeah. 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 Two abstentions from Drs. Kidd and Buell uh, as they were not present. And I'll say yes. Even if it wasn't there. Okay, uh, moving on to item number four, accreditation and laboratory updates. Uh, the first on the agenda is the Onondaga County Center for Forensic Sciences. In September, Ascalad Lab conducted a full assessment and a QAS audit of this lab, and there were no findings during either the assessment or the audit. Uh, lab representatives are here. Um, to answer any questions or, or concerns that any of you may have. I'd like to raise a question about the form on page 28, um, 5214, uh, checked not applicable, and then the comment is the standards are met. Mm -hmm. It's it's seemingly a bit nonsensical um, because it just seems to be um, more work than is necessary. Nothing wrong, just uh, these seem to be extraordinarily bureaucratic issues. Uh, this is more a comment for the QAS process than the laboratory, I think, would be uh, yeah. a fair estimate. Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, your com comments are so understood. <laughs> Other comments or concerns? Then do I have a motion to issue a binding recommendation to the Commission on Forensic Science to renew the New York State accreditation on the Onondaga County Center for Forensic Sciences in the discipline of biology for the time period concurrent with their ASCLAD lab accreditation? So moved. Dr. Buell? Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 That's good. May I raise one more question about this. Yes, sir. On page 66, there uh, actually is on 60, on earlier about all of the equipment. And question 10215 on page 63, electrophoresis detection system. And the comment is the laboratory does not utilize electrophoresis detection, but they use capillary electrophoresis. Right. This is idiocy. That's just the comment. <laughs> I don't know that we can do anything about it. If you'd like, I can convey this to the QAS process. I will memorialize or maybe send them video excerpts of this for their viewing pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be that would probably be helpful. Maybe simply to uh, yeah. uh, explain 
or to add the distinction between exactly uh, gel to explain, uh, yeah, versus to explain this a Correct. little bit right. better so that it is sensible. We certainly Dr. understand Dr. your, your comments. Precisely yeah. correct. <laughs> and I imagine that this would apply to everybody in the QAS lineup within New York State. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, that passed unanimously. Uh, moving on to Erie County uh, Central Police Services. This is the uh, continuation of the accreditation letter and final surveillance report with a non-conformance resolution accepted by the lead assessor. Um, the original report and non-conformance plan were presented to the subcommittee in our past meeting. Uh, this is for informational purposes only and no vote is required. Members of this laboratory are available by telephone if there are any questions related to Erie County. Hearing none, we'll move on. Monroe County Crime Laboratory. <clears throat> this past August, the Monroe County Crime Lab had an ASCLAD lab expanded surveillance visit. Uh, no issues were identified. Members of that laboratory are also available by telephone if there are any questions or concerns. Hearing none, uh, this was also for informational purposes only and no vote is required. Uh, next on the list, D, is Nassau County Medical Examiner's Division of Forensic Services. This past September, the Nassau County Medical Examiner Division of Forensic Services had an external QAS. Uh, there were no findings. Members of that laboratory are available if there are any questions or concerns. I just have a comment, and if, since we're making comments about the QAS documents. Sure. When people have validations that need to be evaluated, I, I like the way the people documented just each type of study that they reviewed for the validation, like sensitivity, specificity, all that kind of stuff, whereas some, of, some assessor or auditors only just put down that they reviewed the validation. So when it's something like um, a validation of, say, a particular kit chemistry on a 3500, you don't know what injection time was validated or, you know, multiple injection times when they just say, give a general, yeah, we reviewed this validation. I like the way it is listed so that should they, for example, validate maybe a 20-second injection time, um, the next, when they have it reviewed, somebody can just say that we reviewed the 20-second injection time. I just wish other auditors, when they do QAS audits, would spell out exactly what was looked at in there. It makes it um, a much easier not to have something happen like um, they're suddenly doing 20-second injection times, but there's no documentation that this validation ever took place or was ever reviewed. Um, it's a lot easier to pick it out when it's delineated right. in old audits, just exactly what they look at. Right, and this is a great comment for now since they're going to be watching this video with popcorn. So this will be a time of all yeah. your QAS woes or concerns to articulate them and pass them down to see if we can get consistency and how that's applied. And Allison, I agree with you, just like I agreed with Ken. <laughs> but then I do have a question. You rerun high your 15-second injection, then... Your default is five. You want to come to the table? We have a booster seat. It's okay. <laughs> oh, Brian. <laughs> so funny. I'm on page uh, 188 of the red. Well, what we'll do is I'll pass her mind because her. Oh, it's not like it can't be 188. <laughs> oh, you're on six, I'm on 62. 62. 62. Okay. It's the 3500 uh, genetic analyzer uh, gene mapper IDX version 1.4. Can you use mine? Thank you. Does it have big print too? Because I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it says rerun high, so 15-second injection. I was just curious, are you doing five-second as your default uh, injection? Yeah, we, we run at the first injection time, and if necessary, then we rerun And high. the first injection time is it's five? It's right down yeah. here at the bottom. I think it's right about here. Uh, rerun high, 15. Who's the first? 
It doesn't say. It does I think. Is. Yeah. No, I think we're seven. Seven seconds. I'm pretty sure we're seven. Okay. I'd have to. I'd have yeah. to. So there's only one shorter injection time, though. Yes. And then yes. okay. There's one shorter, one longer. I thought it was in here. I'm sorry. I got a brief question. Dr. Yeah, you done? Yeah, go ahead. Good morning. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just uh, you validated the uh, Kyogen EZ advanced Excel robot. Uh, could you just briefly discuss uh, what you did before and, and the benefits of this, this um, system? Before the EZ one, we were using the M48. Um, we're using the M48 for uh, exemplars and then. Um, you know, blood stains with a higher volume of blood, larger stains that we wouldn't have issue with. And so we migrated um, to the easy ones. Uh, it was fairly comparable. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, so if, similar we have a, if, so, if we have yeah. a difficult sample or a, a low level sample, we're doing organic. Okay. But with, for those samples, for you had sample, this, this worked well for you. Oh, yeah. 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 Big time saving. Yeah. Okay. And you're, you've got the Y filer validated. How are you going to use that? Yeah. Uh, well, we've, we've always been using Y filer. We were using Y filer on 3130, and then we've now migrated to the 3500. Oh, okay. So that's what they reviewed. I see. Okay. And then next, I guess, we'll go Y filer. <laughs> and so this one is also, what, seven second injection time? Yes, it's the same. Don't quote me on the seven. I have to look at the nine. I'm not running them. I'm not running them. Either. I guess that's no surprise. <laughs> okay. Any other question? Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Next would be uh, Suffolk County Crime Laboratory in August. Uh, this laboratory had an off-site review. There were no findings in September. They had their A2LA external audit. And there was one finding. Uh, members of the lab uh, are present, I believe, uh, for questions. Joe Galdi is present in the laboratory. And I'm also using the booster seat. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't understand the finding. Can you explain? <laughs> the, um, there's a section on our uh, several of our worksheets where we document certain aspects of the technical review. Uh, so, for example, we do an extraction. The extraction may incorporate samples from about five or six different cases. And we list on there that we've done a technical review that the uh, proper heat block temperatures we use, that the proper reagents we use, that they were not expired, they were in service. And we document this at the time the run is completed so that the person doing the tech reviews later on doesn't review this six or seven times. Uh, when we were doing our validation, we used the same worksheets. We didn't fill that area in because, for example, when you're doing a validation, the reagents or kits are not necessarily, are typically not validated for use mm -hmm. yet for casework. Um, the reagents we may use, the expired reagents for validation, or also um, they noted we do contamination checks and we'll use expired reagents for that. So we don't fill it in because it doesn't apply. That only applies in our minds to casework. And the auditor's concern was that these were not being filled in for validation paperwork or for contamination check paperwork. But we don't feel that that's needed <coughs> to be filled in because the tech review applies to casework. Mm -hmm. And this was not casework. Is there like a validation box? You can check up. Say well, the validation was the validation section of the uh, the audit was fine. There was no findings for the validation. I, I guess my only concern, Joe, is uh, to make sure that expired reagents, even though they're marked expired, and you don't use casework, there's still potential that they're adequate to do the experiments that you want to do. Right. Let's say if if you have an enzyme that's expired and it's going to be 30% less active during your, your validation, you, you may come up with a different result than something that's not expired. So I understand the concept behind validation using reagents that haven't gone through the whole validation process, but there's also concern to make sure that 
at the end of the day, you're using top quality reagents to get get the information you need. Right. So that's the and the only thing I'm well, with the validation. The issue is more that we're using kits that are not approved yet for casework purposes. So we can't say that they've been approved for casework because we're not using them on casework right. yet. Right. Right. With the um, expired kits, that typically applies more for when we're doing our contamination check, and we do. Uh, we do swabbings of work areas on a routine basis, mm -hmm. and yeah. we'll use, um, if necessary, we'll use expired reagents for that purpose. Okay. Other questions? Thank you. Uh, this was for informational purposes only, and no vote is required. Moving on to Section 5, Old Business. Uh, Brian, if it's this time, could you give us an update on the partial match status here? Sure. And just for your informational purposes also, the reg changes to partial match that you guys approved at your last meeting went to the commission meeting, but the commission meeting was canceled due to the lack of a quorum. So they'll be going to the December commission <coughs> meeting and then voted on and then if approved, moving through the open public comment period. So most likely, you know, I'm, I, depending on that process, like Jan, you know, February to March, they'll, they'll be done. So I just wanted to give you an update on that. Regarding the status of the partial match program currently, you know, to date, there's uh, 91 times that a partial match has uh, uh, potentially presented itself. Uh, the evaluation could not confirm it 41 times. Uh, names were released in 48 instances. Uh, there are two that are currently pending statistical evaluation, so they are in kind of the limbo process. 46 of those have been closed, closed for various reasons, i.e., they do a family tree and they are not able to, re it doesn't work out uh, along the way that this looks like it's uh, an issue. Um, two of them are still active. Um, in three cases, a relative was identified, and there have been two arrests and one conviction, and one is currently pending in the criminal justice system. And uh, I think that one is in trial now, so I think most likely by February. Uh, or somewhere thereabouts, there'll be, you know, hopefully some conclusion to it. Thank you, Brian. Um, moving on to new business. Uh, we have one item under new business related to uh, probabilistic genotyping. As you know, uh, this DNA subcommittee has approved the use of forensic science tool, true allele, as well as STR mix. Uh, provided that the laboratory has performed the appropriate validation. Uh, historically, uh, this subcommittee has approved the first validation of a new technology in the state, and then subsequent labs would be allowed to come online when they have completed their own internal validation, and I see no reason to change that um, process at this time. In your binders, you will see a letter provided to us by the Onondaga County um, Laboratory indicating that they intend to go online on Monday using STR mix, and they have spent over a year validating this system. Uh, and they are being quite transparent here by providing this subcommittee with their uh, validation study. And um, that is available for your review. I, I must say that uh, uh, seeing that study, uh, I was very impressed with the thoroughness, uh, with its completeness, uh, and uh, it, it really does, I think, serve as a template for laboratories going forward uh, in, in this process. Any comments or questions uh, from the group? That I agree with you, Dwight. It was a beautifully written, very readable, very organized. Um, clearly showed that it addressed all the criteria and um, where they were, the, the criteria were addressed, and I, I thought it was an impressively done validation <coughs> study, well documented. I would agree. Yes, I agree. I, I had a conversation with uh, Kathy last night concerning, and I can just discuss that right now. Kathy, you want to? I was afraid I may not be able to stay for the whole meeting, so uh, Brian put Kathy and I together. And I just had a, uh, a quick question about uh, uh, 
uh, saturation, and Kathy and I discuss that. If you look at uh, page three, yeah, I was hard pressed to say, hey, that's a good place to put that line in the sand. She sort of agrees, but basically that's uh, that's where she's. Well, I won't take words anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it was um, unfortunately the way that we worded that sentence. Um, we didn't determine that. Excuse me one sec. Hello. Hello, this is John Buckleton. He just, uh, just telling to hold and yep. because we're about there. Okay. Uh, Dr. Buckleton, would you mind just holding for the briefest of moments? Happy to do so. Okay. So um, when we when we did this saturation curve, we didn't plot. Um, we didn't necessarily use samples that were very very high because we have a policy in our laboratory that because we're using a 3130 that we have an 8,000 um, 8100 RFU cutoff. So when we have samples that are higher than that, we just rerun them. We don't use them. So in reality, what I'm showing here is that um, this curve is linear up until the point where we wouldn't be using samples above that. So we haven't actually, I, I agree with what Eric's saying. I think it was unfortunately the way I worded it. We haven't actually reached the saturation, and we're not displaying that here. But what I'm saying is that our cutoff is at 8100, and anything below that is going to be linear. Thanks. Do you need to alert Dr. Buckleton as to where we are in this discussion? I, oh. I, I apologize. I had just asked him um, if he could be available in case there were other questions that anyone had. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments about this? Um, any comments about uh, laboratories uh, going online? here with this technology in the future. I Personally, I think that um, this laboratory has done an excellent job in, in setting a framework for any future labs coming in, uh, um, conducting their own validation. Yeah, I would just make one small. I mean, I totally agree, and it's that it's so nice, and I hope that other people can, you know, follow something that's really well organized like this. The only um, one small comment that I had was on the use of significant figures, and I think that that's common. It's common among forensics. Sometimes I think we use too many significant figures that imply a precision that we really don't have, and that would just be my own, that would just be my only comment. Just to be clear, one more time, uh, this subcommittee has already uh, approved the use of STR mix as well as true allele and FST. Um, there is no obligation for laboratories to provide us with their validation study. Um, we certainly appreciate, uh, Kathy, that this was provided, uh, and I think for other laboratories out there, it provides a, an excellent resource and, and framework going forward in the future. But um, n no vote is required. This is for information only. Thank you. Well, Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Buckleton, I think you're welcome to stay and listen to the DNA subcommittee, but I think uh, the agenda is moving on to other topics. Thank you very much. I'll ring off. Have a good day, sir. <laughs> Uh, the next item on the agenda, number seven, uh, relates to laboratory disclosures. Uh, the first on the agenda is Nassau County. Uh, the lab notified ASCLAD lab of a non-conformance on August 17th of 2016. And this is an acknowledgement of that notification. ASCLAD lab requires no further <coughs> updates. Uh, this non-conformance was presented to the subcommittee in our August meeting. No comments or questions. We'll move on to the New York City OCME. Uh, the lab notified ASCLAD lab of a nonconformance in uh, August, uh, August 15th of 2016. This is the acknowledgement of that notification. ASCLAD lab again requires no further updates. Uh, this was presented to the subcommittee in our August meeting. ASCLAD Lab acknowledged receipt of their report and will review documents during the next surveillance activity. Comments? 
is the this is the uh, DNA hits thing that we're talking about. This is the uh, the, the the laboratory completed its um, root cause investigation um, related to pre-population fields uh, can introduce errors samples with nearly identical specimen number IDs. Um, Analysts having little experience, reviewer did not identify the correct specimen. <coughs> right. I think that's and then <coughs> the DNA hits thing, right? Then it was the hits, the new hits. Oh, that's a separate one. Um, so that's the corrective it's, action. It's, yeah, and we have we have members of the lab. If you have a I'm specific sorry. question. Yeah, I, I guess. Can you go through it? Sure. <clears throat> State your name for the. Sure. Uh, Meredith Rosenberg, Quality Assurance Manager. Uh, Louis Vargas, Kiwi Director. Mm -hmm. uh, so, a general overview is that uh, there there is one case that had uh, two separate items, both were caps. And uh, the way that the CODIS profile name was delineated was pretty much the same uh, case number designations, uh, I think similar voucher number designations, um, CAP, and then 1 and CAP 2. So both actually hit uh, offenders. And so both had hits in the system that were entered into DNA hits. And what happens is when you subsequently, there was a hit uh, between our case and a North Carolina uh, evidentiary sample, and it, that cap was cap one. And uh, no, I'm sorry, cap two. That was cap two. And uh, we resolved that with the North Carolina laboratory. Um, we issued uh, the hit on our end through DNA hits, uh, except when the hit was entered, what DNA hits does is it was done for convenience. It will look to see if there were any other hits to that case. It just, most of the time, there's one hit. In this case, there were two. Both happened to have been to similarly named samples. And so it pre-populated the last hit that went in, which was actually to cap one, when it should have been to cap two. And the um, analyst didn't realize it when it happened. They figured it's the cap hit. It pre-populated with the cap name. And the supervisor who reviewed it also missed that. And so although North Carolina had the correct offender's name, the DNA hit was sent out uh, in comparison to a different offender in that case. Uh, and when North Carolina told their investigators to go ahead and, and um, make the arrest as necessary, they actually uh, gave the information from our hit instead of releasing the name that th they had, the correct name. Uh, so the error perpetuated. And so how are you solving this, <laughs> preventing this from happening again? DNA hits has to be reprogrammed so that it won't have this pre-population feature. Exactly. Uh, and uh, we will take into account the recommendation of the Root Cause Analysis Committee to have it maybe where you can enter the specimen ID num name twice to ensure that you're entering. So it won't be a pre-population. You'll have to enter it by hand and even potentially enter it twice. Um, uh, that will take a bit of time because that we have to present this to the mayor's office and they have to release funding and we have to get someone to program it. And so it, it may take a bit of time. But now that the laboratory is aware we can do things in-house, uh, we uh, modified our CODIS manual so that it's it specifically spells out if you have a case where there are two similar samples, maybe red cap versus blue cap. You know, that's how you should name it instead of cap one, cap two. A little bit more uh, delineation in the naming. Uh, we specified in the manual that uh, you specifically should look at every single field to ensure that even in pre-population uh, events now as they're happening that it's being populated correctly. Um, we're going to have a uh, audit of any cases where there's a pre-population event um, until that can get fixed. So we'll, we'll audit a, a, 
a number of the cases where that happens. That's where a monthly audit? We still working out the logistics with our CODIS custodian. Um, it'll likely be a, a, a monthly uh, audit. Uh, we don't know the percentage of samples yet. If it's if it's a very, I think this is a very small number of cases where this happens, and so we may just do all of them, or we may do a percentage depending on how how many we get per month. We still have to look at that, and it should be relatively simple to pull, put aside those cases where that happens because we have a group designated to just CODIS hits of this nature. Some laboratories give each item a unique identifier instead of a, a name. Is that something that could be done? Uh, you mean through the testing process or for yeah, CODIS purposes? Doesn't it have a barcode associated with it? or? Uh, I don't know if that would help um, for CODIS entry. I don't, I don't know how, that, how we would fit that in logistically. All right. Sorry, should I come up earlier? Tim Kufishman, Director of the Laboratory. Um, and also, Lewis is here to answer any questions about the root cause analysis process itself, as he's a root cause analysis officer. Um, the barcode is a 2D barcode, which contains the same information as the whole unique identifier. The unique identifier is the, the case number, uh, item number, and then the description, cap one, cap two. So that is our unique identifier. We don't give it another, mm -hmm. a third party number. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I was curious why it was going to take through January to make a correction in your system. Uh, I, I think that's optimistic. Um, <laughs> the, the, pro the program DNA Hits is owned by the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, uh, which is a mayoral agency independent of NYPD and the OCME. So that's how we have to work the angles, and and then we have to get funding, or they have to get funding, and then we have to hire. A, consultant because this program was written 10 years ago and that programming language is obsolete now. <coughs> not a simple thing. Yeah. Right. And they actually have to specifically hire. It's not technically supported right now. Right. So it's not like you can call a help desk and say make this change. They physically have to contract out RFA, request for proposal type thing, get someone to come in to rewrite, rescript. Uh, that part of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I just want to, I remember in the past, <coughs> That there was something with is is this part of your limb system? <coughs> okay. It's connected. I thought, right. It's connected to the limb system. But it's I not thought there was an issue in the past where I thought like a, a modification could be used to help the laboratory minimize errors and maximize efficiency. So uh, we we do make modifications to our limb system routinely. Okay. Um, but that's a, a separate, separate system, system and a far more modern system. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to the New York State Police. Um, this is the laboratory's notice of a close out of a missing person's nonconformance. Um, this is not required by ASCLAD Lab, but um, we have asked that the labs provide us with uh, close outs of nonconformance uh, when they're considered finalized. Any questions related to the New York State Police Laboratory. The, there is a, a wrong date in here in this letter. Uh, it refers to an incident <coughs> November 20th, 2016. Mm -hmm. I think they mean 2015. What page are you on, uh, Dr. Kidd? Page 333. Yes, 333. Right near the end. Did you want to have clarified for the record what year that was? I, it's fairly obvious it's okay. <laughs> that it's a typo, but uh, the November 20th, 2016 should. Yeah. Right, but do you want to clarify that it's 15, not 14, 13, 12, 11? I don't know what year it is. 
This is the letter in question. Yeah. Need to over there. It in series. It would be 15. Yes, we have a letter here from Dave Polakowski, um, which clearly defines it as November 20th, 2015. Okay. okay. Thank you. That was Dr. Gettig from the State Police. Any other comments? Well, next item on the agenda is the executive session, and can I have a motion to go into executive session to discuss matters related to current investigation for matters for appointment, promotion, demotion, discipline, or suspension of a particular person? So moved. Second. Seconded by Dr. Batcher. At this point, if you're not a member of the DNA subcommittee. Did he just... Take the train down, and now he's going back home. Go. Oh. Okay. At this point, I'd like to go back on the record and report that no action was taken during the executive <coughs> session. The next meeting of the DNA subcommittee will be February 10th, 2017, in New York City. Any final comment before we uh, adjourn? Do I have a motion to adjourn? I so move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.